I remember they said things like that. All right, so go through that again. The light is shining. You said Alif, Alif, and maybe a lamb somewhere, right? Right. So a lamb, and a lamb and and so you saying that? Well, wait, wait, wait. Let's let's stick to a couple of things. The assert the uh, the miracle is that Allah's name is shining in on a board. But you're saying that the board just seemed like it was run out. And from the board being run out, you saw an alif, an alif, a lamb, and a ha somewhere, correct? Right. All right. Uh, and first of all, let's just make it clear that's not the way Allah's name is spelled, okay? It does not have two alifs in it. Secondly, um, I think that it's important to ask how many people looked at it and saw what you saw. But we're going to leave that up to other people. But what we can say is that a number of people who looked at it do not really know how to write Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like if they did not have to look anywhere, to, but just write Allah's name, they won't be able to, uh, to, to spell it. Because again, you know, it, it would be. Um, but you're saying that this miracle happened in New York as well as in the Carolina? Or did it happen in Virginia as well? Yes. As far as, okay, so these two New York in. I don't remember, I don't remember, I, mean, I don't remember, the only miracles I remember being in Virginia um, happened in um, our lady's house on South. She had said, um, this is funny too, I don't, this is how you know these people were either staging this or doing it themselves because the jelly, she said the jelly, her homemade jelly uh, had spilled on her stove in Allah's name. And they said it was a miracle, and the whole community was going crazy about it. Okay. You know, that some jelly had spilled in a certain way and spilled Allah's name on her stove. This is interesting. But, so this was another miracle. This is a miracle that happened in Virginia where someone spilled jelly on her stove, and it it, it looked, it, it, it appeared to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. So, this is real story. Story. Through jelly? Jelly. Okay. Um, were there? Did you? Did you happen to have any conversation about you know other type of personal spiritual experiences that people were having due to their spiritual leader? No, not that I can recall. I mean, with uh, with my peers, I actually take that back. With my peers, yeah, I remember um, there were certain 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 friends that maybe I had who um who were maybe on the same path as me, or we were on the same path, but maybe we didn't we didn't know it at the time because we were younger. But when we would talk about the community, or we would maybe talk about um you know Abuji, we'd be like, man, I can't even understand what he's saying, or who is this guy, and um. Like what is going on? We didn't. We didn't. We knew that our parents had, you know, had um had been following him. We were part of a community that maybe was about whatever he was about, but it just didn't. Sometimes it didn't resonate with us. And when we definitely when we went to the Hafiz school and started seeing other Muslims, and then we started saying like, hey, isn't there other Muslims in the world besides us? I thought we were the only ones that we would have conversations like this. So it would um. The conversations we had with each other sometimes maybe I think pulled us towards uh, a better answer for ourselves because I think we had just accepted whatever answer was in front of us at the time was that Abuji was who he was and we were in the Jamaat. So now, as as time went on, uh, you went to the Hafiz school. You came to the conclusion that. It was completely false. The miracles were false. The predictions were false. In fact, he was claiming to be somebody he wasn't. Is that right or no? That's correct. That's correct. Very good. So then, I had never, I had never uh, again, I had never uh, made that public. I had never. Um, I guess you could say I had acknowledged it, maybe sub consciously that I was not I was not a believer or a follower of that particular um, community or doctrine um, 
but I had still, I had still, I was a sympathizer because remember, I had, I was on my own separate journey with cool my family and immediate, um, you know, kinfolk and, and family were uh, in, uh, in the community. I was still a part of, I was still in the community. So I, I was, I had this ideology that was different from those around me, but I had never been public to them. I see. Um, and when what happened when you did make it public to your parents? How old were you when you really started um, saying to your parents, this is false? And what was their reaction? Are you there? So um, I had to have been, I had to have been around, this is when I was speaking out against it. I was, I had come from Africa. No, and even then, when I had came back from Africa, I had still kept it within myself because obviously I was there for three, you know, people might not know I was in Senegal, between Senegal and Gambia for around three and a half years. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Hold hold on a minute. Hold on a second. Because we will have to elaborate a little bit on the Hafiz program. It started off as a Hafiz program in 2009. 2012, it became a Hafiz school where you were boarding and you would go back and forth between where the program had initiated, which was at the Masjid in Red House, Virginia, correct? Correct. And after 2012 or 2000, let's say about 2000, around 2013, uh, the program and the school moved out of Red House, Virginia into Richmond, Virginia. Is that correct? That's correct. And along with you were other students who had uh, transitioned over to Richmond. And we, there are some, some you know, high-level discussions that we'll need to have. But um, for now, um, once you uh, reach Richmond, you were in Richmond at the ICR location under the uh, under the the same half is teacher and teachers a new teacher, but then you transitioned over to Africa. Now your transition to Africa, the purpose of that was what exactly? What was your reason for going to Africa? Become Hafiz. Okay, well, so you went to Africa to become Hafiz. I was ready for to become a Hafiz. Okay. No, let me take it back. I had I was studying Quran to become a Hafiz ever since I had entered the program in twenty in two thousand and nine, mm-hmm. and and from the and in the school in two thousand and twelve, um, and I guess you could say from uh, from I could say now you could say, um, my real reason for going to Africa was to just to go to Africa. It, it definitely was like the purpose was to go, to you know to learn Quran obviously, but I think a deeper part of it was to go and explore outside of this country after after doing some reflecting and thinking on it i had this conversation it was really just more to get out of my current environment and go see something more than what i was experiencing more than what i was seeing in richmond after having my worldview open i wanted to further expand it you know outside of the country okay um again there are some high level conversations that we can have about that um at a later date i think it's important to have but for now we need to stick with you know the the actual uh, trail here um because specifically you went to africa you spent 3 years or 4 years in africa um I'm about a three and a half so almost 4 almost 4 and what country in africa did you go to Senegal. You went to Senegal. Uh, Senegal. I spent uh, time there. Okay. Two and a half years. Two and a half years. One and a half spent in Gambia. And then you went one and a half years to Gambia. Very good. So once you came back from your journey of exploring outside the United States, you confronted your parents at some point. This was the year. The year I actually spoke out against it, and just before before I say what I um before that, I had a conversation when I came came back in the first month that I came back with a uh, with a student who was in the hospice program. He was in the hospice program, um, and we had we had gone to Richmond. We had you know we had maybe gone out to eat or something. And on the way back, the topic of the Jamaat and the Buji came up. And at this 
point, um, you know, I'm still a sympathizer, but he is speaking out against it. He has been speaking out against it. He had not been a part of it for time, I guess, but I hadn't known this. And the conversation that took, uh, took, I, I took a real nasty turn and we, um, we had got, we had turned into an argument, a debate had turned into an argument and violence was almost ari- arisen because I had, I had defended the Jemaah and Mubarak Jelani. I had defended them and he, he um he had gotten very um angry about that and i was i was confused as to why he got angry when i as, as i defended the jamaat and mubarak Jelani. but after after maybe another year of um of thinking and you know always thinking about that conversation we had about them and why did he get so angry about you know me defending them is when i had started to um is when i had started to go into like if i don't believe in it then why should i why should i defend it if i don't agree with it you know, or believe in it. Why should I? Why should I speak highly of it or defend it in situations where people, you know, speak the truth out against it? And at that point is when I started to, um, I started to view. If people asked me if I was in Team MOA, if I believed in it, instead of saying yes, I would tell them no, is I don't believe in it. And then it trickled down to some days where eventually it got to the, um, it got in the household with my family. And they would, you know, I would speak out against it. I would just be like, well, you know, he's not who he says he is, or it can't be like this because the Quran says this, or other Muslims don't do this. This isn't, this doesn't, this isn't right. And then um, it was always met with uh, animosity, you know, it was always met with animosity at the time, or, you know, harsh words. And uh, yeah, it just wasn't, when I had spoke out against it in the beginning, I was met with a lot of hostility and it was kind of hard to bear. Because it came from family, you know. Okay. So, animosity as a result of you defending something that you don't believe in. Animosity in those who believe in it and how they respond to you. There you have it. Um, do you remember, do you have, I mean, you probably, this you won't, you probably will not be able to answer, but... Um, at, you know, you and some student were having a conversation and you were in defense. Do you remember at what point in the conversation really triggered? Uh, in other words, is it something that you had said specifically that really triggered up the conversation? Yes, I, it was exactly, I remember. Okay. It, was, it was the topic of the Jamaat. The Jamaat was, um, the Jamaat had messed up people's lives or had set people back. And the, the teachings of Mubarak Jelani had set people back. And my response um, to him telling me that, my response was, well, nobody put a gun to your head. You know, nobody forced you, you nobody forced you to be a part of the Jamaat. It was all choice, whether it was your, your parents or their parents, nobody forced you to be a part of this community. And um, when he said that, he had basically, that's when he had gone into a rage about where, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a choice. We had no choice. You know, they, they made us do it. Okay. You know, and then um, I hadn't agreed with that. I, I believe it was a I, choice. You say, you, you say, wish you had you in it, but you stayed in it. <laughs> okay. You say that this was one of the students who had transitioned over to Richmond. How many students transitioned uh, to Richmond? Uh, no, for? no, he was not. He was not a student. He was not a student that had transitioned to Richmond. He was, he was a, a student who, um, after after the transition to Richmond was made, that's when his um his stay at the school stopped. Okay. Um, there are a number of students who stopped on the earlier eight stages, uh, such as those who went on the retreat um, when the program first started. Uh, I think this will come up again and again. Um, and then there were some who did not transition into the Hafiz school itself. So this also um, meant that some students who transitioned over to Richmond uh, were not necessarily, uh, or I should say, not all students from the school transitioned into Richmond, correct? And then not all students in, from Richmond actually went to Africa. But you're saying that this student uh, left before transitioning into Richmond. They left also TMOA, correct? Around that time, yeah, I guess, um, I guess you could say that, yeah. Okay. Um, but I think to expand on the fact that, you know, the two of you were having a civil conversation, then you start talking about TMOA, 
and how it has messed up people's lives from his part in Abuji. You know, the spiritual leader has misguided. You say not everybody put, not anybody put a gun to your head for you all to have done that. And then he says, we never did have a choice. And then it starts, the conversation really picks up from there. So at this point, when you look back at it, uh, is he correct in that? Uh, you know, they did not have a choice but to follow now that you look back at your own situation? That's, um, that's actually very hard to answer for me because I'm conflicted because I know that I, I had a choice. Well, I, if you could say, if I was born into something, if I was born into something, and I'll answer your question like this. If I was born into something, and followed it up until I had reasoning. Did I have a choice to, after I found reasoning, did I have a choice to follow it or to, to go away from it? And I think my answer would be, if you have, if you have, uh, you know, intelligence enough that when you had your own, you, you can make your own choice, you know, it's on you at that point. But if you continue to follow something due to circumstance, it's um you can't blame circumstance if you know if because if you know better you'll do better, I guess I could say. So I don't think I don't I still think that if you you, you had a choice and people had a choice. I see. I think. Uh, well, you know we're talking uh, historical uh, data because again the book that you mentioned uh, that you had never seen, I think you have seen it in my possession that you didn't realize or recognize it. So um, I think also that... Uh, oh, if I think about it, if I think about it, was it the book that you actually handed to me? Well, I, I handed you, thing, again, I handed you many books, but, but to, make it, to make it easier for you to uh, be satisfied with your answer, I still have the book in my possession. <laughs> Now, um, I and I and I really feel that um, problems uh, cannot be solved if they are not discussed. And opening to a civil dialogue about all these things is the first step in in solving them. But if you do not talk about them, you do not conver- converse about them, have the necessary discussions, then yeah. So, you know, we're going to continue to have uh, the, the open ear as long as uh, the, 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 the person feels the right, the individual uh, feels that we have given them the right to speak. Anyone who has the right to speak, and that is meaning everyone, then they should be willing to give the right of listening to the, to the other party, just likewise. So... Um, I think we will we will stop here with this uh, this very intense uh, interview uh, and and pick it up inshallah on a later date. Sounding good, correct? Oh, that sounds very good.